so when thinking about Karl Marx, uh, something I know all of you do regularly, <laughs> we, uh, we tend to think about one thing, uh, communism. What's ironic is that for a man who has come to be so powerfully associated with the, powerful, the power of ideas, uh, Marx himself actually believed that ideas were quite powerless. In other words, rather than viewing history as a uh, succession of brilliant people with brilliant insights, Marx analyzed society in terms of its material conditions and famously proposed the, that class conflict rather than intellectual innovation is the motor of progress. The dominant ideas in a given era are merely the ideas of the dominant people. And in some sense, uh, it is not because, but in spite of these ideas, that progress occurs. So when I received the invitation to give a TED Talk at UCSD, I was ecstatic. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't actually watched many TED Talks at that point. Uh, but I knew the types of people who are usually invited to give these things. Uh, people like Bill Gates, Sheryl Sandberg, Richard Dawkins, J.K. Rowling. And me? <laughs> I was going to have something in common with the genius behind Harry Potter? Wow. Uh, this struck me as extraordinary and an opportunity I couldn't afford to mess up. So I started doing my research. Uh, I watched TED Talks, tons of them, religiously. I started asking my friends for uh, suggestions about what to talk about. I, I bought a book uh, called Talk Like TED, The Nine Public Speaking Secrets of the World's Top Minds. <laughs> <laughs> and I slept with it under my pillow for an entire week. I even watched all the Onion Talks, uh, just to be sure. They're quite funny. Um, <laughs> but finally, I found what I was looking for. So a few years ago, uh, statistics whiz Sebastian Wernicke did something unprecedented. Uh, he analyzed data on TED Talks in order to figure out how to give the best possible TED Talk. And he presented these results, uh, you guessed it, as a TED Talk. <laughs> Specifically, currently available on TED.com are over 1,000 different TED Talk videos, uh, complete with transcripts and millions of user ratings. Sebastian downloaded uh, and analyzed these data in order to reverse engineer the ultimate TED Talk. What's more, the next year he gave a new talk uh, and used Mechanical Turk to distill all of these thousand talks into a single six-word summary. So you see where this is going. Uh, <laughs> according to Sebastian's analysis, all I had to do was get up here, say these six words, and I would give the best, most brilliant TED Talk that you've ever heard. <laughs> right? Well, if I were you, I'd be pissed and want my money back for six, uh, six words, if that's all I gave you. So um, in truth, I didn't come here today to talk about Sebastian, but his uh, work did inspire me to conduct a separate analysis of my own. You see, I'm a sociologist, and as any sociology majors in the room can attest, uh, we tend to think about the world in a slightly different way than most people. So while Sebastian identified what you have to say to give a brilliant TED Talk, I wondered, who do you have to be in order to have your ideas heard on TED in the first place? So I called up Sebastian, super nice guy, and asked if he would be willing to share his data. Uh, not only did he agree, but it turns out he's actually kept this data set updated so that it now contains information on 1,497 talks as recent as last year. So I took this data set of talks, and a wonderful undergraduate uh, research assistant, Jaime Flores Lobo, was kind enough to look up all of these talks on the internet and code them with respect to a very basic uh, but very consequential characteristic, the gender of each speaker. I then analyzed these data using descriptive statistical methods, and here is what I found. So as I mentioned, uh, on TED.com as of last year were about 1,500 talks, excluding 18 talks that were given by mixed gender groups of people. This left uh, 1,096 talks given by men, 382 talks given by women, and one talk given by Einstein, an African gray parrot. Uh, <laughs> a female parrot, to be fair. Um, so it didn't seem right to include the parrot. It also didn't seem right to include 44 talks presented at TED events specifically for women. So throwing out those talks, this still left 76% of talks given by men and only 24% of talks given by women, who, as you may know, uh, represent approximately 50% of the population. So we know that TED Talks are more likely to be given by men. But for those women who are selected to speak, uh, who are they and what do they tend to talk about? 
So I looked at the 20 most popular talks given by men and given by women. Uh, among the top male talks, for instance, we see three psychologists, a, uh, problems with the clicker here, a leadership expert, uh, a success analyst, a entrepreneur, and a conductor, as in orchestra, not choo-choo train. <laughs> <laughs> Turning attention to the uh, top female talks, actually a full quarter of them were given by authors of some sort, whether novelists or writers or a poet. Uh, we also saw a love expert, uh, someone whose advice I probably could have used for most of my life, <laughs> and a model, right? So uh, these are two occupations you certainly don't see on the male list, and, and what do we gather from this? Well, if we want to learn about uh, leadership or success or how people think, we can turn to men. If we want to learn about looks or love or uh, how people write, we can turn to women. So uh, these are just some arbitrary examples. We can go a bit uh, deeper. So my second step... I looked at all 1,500 titles of each of these talks and compared the frequency of certain words. So, for instance, uh, men like to give talks about the world, about the future, about new stuff, uh, about time, about, what else do we have here, life, about the brain, about power. I really apologize about the clicker. <laughs> um, about energy and about technology. Uh, women, meanwhile, also like to talk about uh, New World stuff, um, as well as uh, talking about life. They also talk about art. They talk about uh, the body. They talk about peace and, God forbid, compassion. Uh, they talk about apes. <laughs> it turns out um, there are a few uh, talks given by primatologists, and, of course, they talk about women. We can go one step further uh, and actually look at the frequency of certain words in the talks themselves, looking at the actual transcripts. And it turns out, for instance, that uh, women are about twice as likely to talk about sex. Men are about 25% more likely to talk about power. Uh, women say the word feel, where men tend to say the word think. Uh, women will talk about art, where men talk about science. Women are more likely to refer to the body, where men refer to the mind. Women are slightly, uh, say, say slightly more frequently the word meaning, whereas men uh, say the word success. And women, again, are more likely to say the word women, whereas... <laughs> um, Men are preoccupied with, uh, with robots. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that women are less likely to give TED Talks than men. And we know that when they do, they tend to work in particular occupations. They tend to talk about certain things. And they even tend to use uh, slightly gendered language. This leaves one question. Uh, how are these talks received on the internet by viewers like yourself? Well. Right off the bat, it turns out that uh, female talks are much, much less likely to be viewed. It turns out the average female talk uh, receives about 40,000 fewer views than the average male talk. On the other hand, it also turns out that these talks are evaluated differently. So if you go on TED.com and uh, you watch a talk, you have the opportunity to rate that talk across 14 different dimensions. Comparing the distribution of these different ratings uh, across men and women, we see, for instance, that uh, male talks are likely to be rated as more fascinating, more funny, more informative, more ingenious, whereas female talks, meanwhile, are rated as more beautiful, more courageous, more inspiring, and slightly more obnoxious. <laughs> uh, awkward laughter. <laughs> so two things here are possible, right? Uh, one is that people are biased and are holding men and women to different standards. The other, of course, is that uh, male talks are uh, more fascinatingly funny, while female talks are more courageously obnoxious. Um, how do we tell the difference between the two explanations? Well, I ran a statistical model where I tried to predict the quantity of views received by each talk as a function not only of gender, but of all 14 dimensions of ratings and a few other attributes. Uh, so this model posits, basically, a hypothetical scenario. Let's imagine two talks uh, that are exactly as old. These talks are also identical in terms of the ratings they've received uh, from viewers. So as judged by viewers, they are equally uh, fascinating, equally funny, equally obnoxious, and so forth. In other words, the only discernible difference between these two talks is that one was given by a male and one was given by a female. The female talk is still penalized by about 16,000 views. What's more, if that talk happens to be about discrimination, another 80,000 people are disinterested in watching it. Worse still, if you happen to mention gender, people really don't want to hear about that. 
Uh, interestingly, uh, viewers are receptive to more neutral language like inequality and prejudice. But the bottom line is that just for being a woman and just for talking about a couple topics that women may find particularly relevant, uh, these speakers are penalized in the tens of thousands of views. There's one more chapter to this story, and uh, that is that gender is not the only variable we analyzed. Using information on names, on detailed speaker biographies, and on appearance, we also coded the racial background of every person who gave a TED Talk in this data set. And I then replicated just a few of the same analyses. So 80% uh, of all talks are given by white speakers. 11% uh, of all talks are given by Asian speakers, 5% by black speakers, 2% uh, by Hispanic speakers, and 2% uh, we weren't able to code. For reference, by the way, the US population uh, is about 12% uh, black people and 16% uh, Hispanic. Looking at the 20 most popular talks uh, given by Asian speakers, for instance, we see a theme of education, of human-computer interaction, of a few child prodigies. Uh, looking at black speakers, we see another theme of education, a few musicians, a couple inventors, and Colin Powell. <laughs> and actually, of the 1,500 talks, there were only 26 of them given by Hispanic speakers, then, uh, by Hispanic speakers. five of them by the same person, uh, including a recurring uh, guitarist also, a couple authors, and a storyteller. Finally, if I run the same statistical model, in other words, I compare talks with identical characteristics, uh, identical ratings, where the only difference between the two talks is the racial background of the speaker. We see that talks given by Asian speakers are penalized by about 50,000 views compared to white speakers. Talks given by black speakers are penalized by about 100,000 views compared to white speakers, uh, unless you're Colin Powell, and then the effect is uh, much less. And talks given by Hispanic speakers receive, on average, 135,000 fewer views than talks given by white speakers, just for being Hispanic. Even worse, if you happen to talk about discrimination, and worse still, if you mention racism. So what do we have here? Let's imagine a population that is perfectly diverse with respect to some characteristic. One type of person, first, is more likely than another type of person to be selected to give a TED Talk in the first place. Second, that type of person tends to have different things to say than the other type of person, so it's not just that they are disproportionately represented. Their ideas and interests are, too. Third, simply because of their identity, people are more likely to listen to that type of person, such that they effectively have a louder voice and their ideas have greater impact. This does not sound to me like a story of ideas worth spreading, which is, of course, the TED slogan. It sounds to me like a story of people worth listening to, where worth is defined in the same traditional ways, not by the content of someone's mind or character, but by the color of their skin and whether they happen to be born as a male or a female. The upshot of this process is that the ideas reaching the public via TED tend to be a relatively specific set of ideas coming from a specific segment of the population. Overall, talks given by white men collectively have received 260 million more views than talks given by everyone else combined. So that insofar as TED is concerned, the ideas of the dominant class indeed predominate. Now, I want to uh, clarify a few limitations here. First of all, um, I'm of course not suggesting that race and gender are the only dimensions of TED Talk inequality. Uh, unfortunately, speakers tend not to report their income on their profiles, and other characteristics like sexual orientation are uh, complicated to code. Uh, second, well, one response is, uh, well, look, the fact is women and minorities tend to occupy uh, particular positions in society, particular jobs, whereas white men tend to hold positions of power. How is TED supposed to provide equal representation when society itself is so imbalanced? And I would say, uh, yes, you're absolutely right, society is imbalanced. And unless we change something, it's only going to stay that way. Third, uh, I need to emphasize that the data I'm analyzing uh, are not all TED Talks everywhere, but only those TED Talks on the TED website. That said, I'm not sure which is worse, uh, bias in the selection of TED speakers or bias in which talks uh, get publicized, uh, especially given that it's exactly those talks on the TED website that are most likely to receive the most attention. 
somehow, I would be very surprised if mine is selected to be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not a new message, right? Uh, white men occupy positions of power in all sectors of society, from the boardroom to the lecture hall, and have done so for ages. We've only recently seen our first non-white president. Uh, we've yet to see our first female president. These alone are embarrassing reflections of the state of racial and gender inequality uh, in this country. The trouble is, we usually only hear this type of argument from women and from minorities. In other words, we hear it precisely from those people who are statistically less likely to be in a position to do anything about it. And when we do hear these perspectives, they are too often dismissed or ignored. Women have entirely separate TED conferences just to talk about women's issues, right? Where simply mentioning the word gender or racism in a TED talk means people are less likely to watch it. These are not women's issues. These are not minority issues. These are issues. And until we start recognizing that, until we stop marginalizing people on the basis of race or gender and stop putting megaphones in the hands of people like me who probably need it the least, for all of our talk of ideas and innovation and change, our society as a whole is going nowhere. Let me finish with this. Uh, I recognize, and all of us here know, that the specific actions and events that reproduce inequality are not always deliberate or even conscious, and I think that's important to keep in mind. It would be simplistic and unhelpful to think that Ted is racist, I'm quite confident they're not, or that people on the internet go out of their way to avoid talks given by women, I'm quite sure most of them don't. I also want to make clear that I genuinely appreciate the uh, invitation to be here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak, and I hope this talk has come across as constructively critical rather than uh, self-righteous in any way. That was not my intention. But as uncomfortable as it may be, I think it's time we start educating people and organizations and start holding them accountable for their prejudicial behavior, intentional or not, while ideally uh, welcoming the same education and accountability when others do the same for us. I'll leave you with one more uh, quote from Marx. Thanks. <laughs>